Welcome to the Dealmaker Diaries, where you hear directly from the dealmakers who you invest with. M&A, real estate syndication, and more. Strap in for unparalleled advice, wisdom, and insight from some of the world's best business minds with Don Thomas and G1C Group. Welcome, everyone, to episode 55 of Dealmaker Diaries. Today we have with us Zach Booth. So Zach is the host of Driving for Dollars Mastery Podcast, where Zach shares his insider secrets to finding massively discounted properties, regardless of experience level. Zach went from a successful window cleaner to an even more successful millionaire real estate investor. With his constantly growing business, he now spends his time helping others see how simple it is to make money with real estate. Zach built the dream real estate business, and he's to show you how you can do it too. So let's give Zach a warm welcome to the show. Let's go. Zach, welcome to the show. How are you today? Doing awesome. Doing awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, ex- yeah, absolutely. So great to have you on. And Zach, before, I know you're quite busy and you're out and about. So before we hop in, why don't you tell the um, listeners a little bit about your background and how you got into real estate? Yeah, so my, my professional background, um, I you know started off uh, mowing lawns for my family business. You know, I started working when I was 11 years old. Uh, you know, my dad at 16 years old, I, I had been mowing lawns for them and stuff. And, and he ended up getting rid of the business and kind of quit doing it. But at 16 years old, uh, I was still, you know, doing some odd jobs. I was still working in the old family business for other people and um, doing a little bit of construction here and there. But he cut me off financially at 16 years old. And he's, you know, not completely, you know, he, I didn't have to pay for food or housing, but if there's anything else I wanted, he said, you're a man now, you, you're going to figure it out. You know, if you want a truck, he wouldn't even co-sign a loan. He's like, you'll get the, try it. Um, and you know, if you want to play basketball for a high school basketball team, do it, pay for your own stuff, your own camps, your own shoes, like it's on you. And so, um, it kind of forced me to figure out a way to make more money with less time. And just, you know, seven bucks an hour. Um, I was working jobs and at night and trying to do school. And I decided to start a business. I started a window cleaning business when I was 17 years old. And uh, I ran with it. I worked my butt off. Um, you know, within a few years, I had three trucks and 13 employees and was just working my butt off. Um, but it got to the point when I started having a family that it wasn't enough, I wasn't living up to my own expectations. And so I started searching, like, what could I do? How could I do it? And I had uh, read rich dad, poor dad when I was 14. And so I wanted to get into real estate. And so when I was newly married, I was in my early twenties and uh, I had bought a duplex and I was living in one side and renting the other and the tenants were paying the mortgage and then some. But then when I went to go get another one, they wanted 25% down. And mm-hmm. I had issues with, um, you know, my credit and then willing to give me enough debt because I didn't have a lot of history on my credit. There was just all sorts of issues that kept me from buying more. And so I wanted to do real estate, but I was like, well, how do I do real estate when I'm not wealthy and I don't have a wealthy uncle. It's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? How do I build wealth through real estate when I don't have wealth? And mm-hmm. I just felt alone and lost in it. So I started listening to podcasts like this. And ultimately I found my mentor, Tom Kroll. And he taught me that you could find deeply discounted opportunities and sell them, you know, you know, without having to buy the house, you sell the opportunities, essentially you sell the purchase contracts. And I was like, that's it. That's my thing because I can build cash. I can get lots of cash and I get discounted opportunities that I can keep for myself. So I started doing real estate wholesaling uh, was the term and, and then got really good at it and started cherry picking, building rentals. And um, along the way, Tom encouraged me to help other people and give back. And I accidentally became a coach 
<laughs> which was never the intention, you know? And, and so that's kind of my journey, you know, to where I am at now. I still do a ton of real estate, real estate wholesaling. I'm actively doing what I teach, but I also help other people as well. So that's, that's kind of my professional background. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and I've heard about this um, very unique 40 day real estate challenge that you did. And um, tell us a little bit about that. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. So I, I wanted to show people that it was possible, like how to start from scratch, you know, for people that were kind of stuck, um, how I was stuck, you know, they wanted to be in real estate, but how do they start? What's the steps? What does it look like? Like, is it even possible? And, um, you know, like I said, yeah, I do coach. I'm not here to like tell you guys about my coaching for you to sign up. I, I want to give you this free access. It's all free content. But what I did is I, I wanted to show people step by step what it took to get started. Um, so I came up with this crazy idea. I was going to fly across the country somewhere I'd never been. And I got a thousand bucks, right? That didn't cover housing and food and all that stuff. And I assume most of the people that want to do this business, they can at least cover their their living expenses and maybe an additional thousand bucks. So that's what I got is a thousand bucks. And my goal is to make the average American income in just 40 days by, by doing what's called driving for dollars. I drive around, find ugly houses, reach out and see if they want to sell. Once I find someone that wants to sell, get it at a discount where I can sell the purchase contract for an assignment fee. And I was going to document day by day and try and make the average American income in just 40 days, which was 40 grand. Um, and so it's a day by day documentary of of tackling that challenge. All right, very cool. And where can you where can you find that online? Yeah, so there's a quick link that I can give. It's called DFD stands for Driving for Dollars. DFDMastery.com forward slash forty in forty. Um, so if you get it there, uh, you'll also be able to subscribe to our email list and get a bunch of other awesome free resources. Or you can go directly to my YouTube channel and, and catch it there. You just go to my playlists and that'll be the 40 day challenge playlist in my YouTube channel. All right. Excellent. We'll run all of those links um, across the screen as well. All right. Excellent. Yeah, and the YouTube, YouTube channels, DFD mastery with Zach Booth, by the way. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. So Zach, let's um, dig a little deeper into the um, finding discounted property. So, um, how, how, how do you go about, what's your strategy for going about finding those for somebody who's hearing about this for the first time and they wanted, they're interested in doing that? What was your strategy yeah. for, how are you successful in doing that? Yeah, so I've tested a lot of different strategies. I, I currently do radio, SEO, PPC. Um, I, I do lots of different strategies, but my most profitable where we make over a million dollars a year over the last handful of years is doing what's called driving for dollars. So driving for dollars is, is honestly the best way to get your first deal, but it's, you know, and it's known for that to help you get your first deal. But if it's done right, it's also a, a process to find discounted deals that you can scale and do a lot of deals through it. So um, for those that aren't familiar with driving for dollars, it's, it's one of the most uh, age old ways of finding discounted real estate. Um, we drive around, we, we identify houses that have physical signs and neglect. And then we figure out who owns them and reach out and see if they want to sell, right? And so that's my strategy. It's what I teach my students. It's the system that, that I use to, to make a ton of money. Um, you know, without that, I, I wouldn't have much of a business at all. Okay. And, and when you're driving, do you, partic do you pick a particular area that you want to drive? And are you strategic in, in, that, in that realm? A hundred percent. So let me break down uh, the, the areas, how to choose your areas that y'all should drive um, and uh, what properties you look for. So the, the first thing that I do is you want to figure out what the median house price is for your area. So go to Google search median house price and then put your city um, and it's going to pop up a number like Zillow usually will give it to you. Now, what I want you to do is go into Zillow.com, look up houses for sale, houses that have sold in the last 12 months. And there's going to be little dots that'll pop up with a number, right? And they're going to tell you how much they sold for, what they're listed for. And uh, what you want to do is you want to comb those areas where the majority of the houses are at that median house price or lower, right? And then you want to click on a couple of them, make sure they're not condos or, you know, uh, twin homes or anything like that. They're single family homes and, and that these houses 
are 1990, 2000s and older year builds, right? So those are your areas. So you're going to circle those areas on your map. You can print out a map or buy a map and start circling those areas that you're going to go drive. Right now, you know where to drive. Next is like, what do we look for? So what you want to look for is houses that have any physical signs of neglect. So um, wh why is this? It's important to know why. Uh, it helps you identify what to look for. So when someone wants to sell their house at a discount, some people will hear that. It's like, nobody wants to sell their house at a discount. It's like, no, a small percentage does, right? They really do. Um, they like, like, for example, uh, why would anyone sell to a pawn shop, right? Pawn shops exist everywhere. They, they want to sell to a pawn shop because they want speed and convenience over the money, right? The speed yeah. and convenience is more valuable to them than the money. Um, so uh, what we essentially are is a pawn shop for houses, right? We're trying to find someone that has a house that it's, that's a problem. They don't want to deal with it. Some people think we're taking advantage. People are down and out on their luck. It's actually the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, most of the time, they're, they're wealthy investors that don't want to deal with it, right? They're tired landlords. They got one or two problematic properties. It's like, dude, take it. I don't care. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with a real estate agent. I don't want to deal with evictions. Just take the dang thing. Uh, that or inherited properties where they got mm. problematic family living in the house and they had to fly in and they're the executor and they're just like, dude, take care of all my problems, please. Where do I sign? Right. Um, th those are the kinds of situations. And so uh, usually when a house uh, has those situations going on, the owners don't love the house. Since they don't love the house, they don't take care of the house. Right. The grass is long. There's uh, deferred maintenance, peeling paint, shingles blowing off. You know, you'll be driving down the street. He's like, man, that house is not loved. So that's what we're looking for. Um, so any physical science and neglect, I, I mentioned a couple uh, big, big things that we're looking for is transition periods, couches on the lawn, uh, building materials, dumpsters, moving vehicles. Um, when the house looks completely unused, right? Mm -hmm. There's no yard decorations, nothing in the yard, like nothing around the house usually means it's potentially vacant or unused. Um, and, uh, and, and there's potential there. So we're, that's what we're looking for. Um, and then there's ways to add, and we can go into more depth if you would like, on like, you know, how to add those properties efficiently, um, how to market to those houses. I mean, however, however deep you want to go. Okay. All right. And, um, and let's talk about, so once you purchase it and your exit plan, how, how do you get the most from your investment? during that time span? Do you have a certain strategy that you follow with the properties you purchase? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think it's a big mistake. Many, many people flip houses, many people buy and hold uh, rentals, right? And mm -hmm. that's their preferred strategy to make money off their discounted opportunities. And I love both those strategies. There's nothing wrong with those strategies. But I believe that everyone should have the ability to wholesale meaning you have a list of buyers, of other flippers, other buy and hold investors, you know, people that want to deal with, with buying rentals or buying flips. And the reason I say this is you might be doing marketing and finding discounted opportunities for your own flipping business. And you might have a deal that's like, man, it kind of makes sense. I'm not really sure. Um, and what we'll do on every single deal that comes across our table is we'll evaluate what's the best thing we can do with this property. So even if I want to keep it as a rental, what I'll do is I'll email blast it out. Hey, I've got this assignable contract, come in and do the inspection with me and see what you want to, you know, see what you do on this house. And if I get someone that'll come in and they're desperate to get a house because they got a 1031, they're trying to move money for taxes and they're willing to pay a, 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 a crazy amount I'm just going to sign that contract versus keeping it because it makes the most sense. It, it makes my money grow faster than any mm -hmm. other strategy, right? So each one of my properties, I evaluate it as like, what's the best strategy to use? And, and I really think it's a mistake not to at least have sole, wholesaling and having a buyer's list is one of your tools in your tool belt. So, so yeah, we, we just evaluate each one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and Zach, for the properties that you keep for your own actual portfolio that you're actually fixing and flipping yourself. So with the environment right now with interest rates rising, how do you 
mitigate your risk in times like these? Because I think the last time was, what, 2004 to 2007. So how are you mitigating your risk to make sure you're still taking the most advantage of these opportunities? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually probably a little more conservative than most investors. Um, you know, I, I have a couple rules. Um, and the other thing is, is I cherry pick deals when I have the money to cherry pick deals. So I follow a strategy financially call, uh, uh, based off of a book called Profits First. So whenever I write myself a profit check from my investing business or any of my other revenue sources, um, I will take that and divvy that up. I'll put a certain percentage into cash reserves, uh, a certain percentage towards uh, you know my charity stuff that I'm doing and uh, take a portion and put it towards uh, real estate, a portion towards um, you know crypto, gold. And I have a few different asset classes that I'm putting some money towards. And um, once I have enough in my investment portfolio cash account, um, mm -hmm. then I'll, I'll be looking for an investment to deploy that money. Um, so whenever I uh, buy a rental, if I leverage debt on it, sometimes I don't always leverage debt. I do have quite a few paid off just because I want to have uh, two times more cash flow than my monthly expenses and my uh, my financing costs. So my property manager, my taxes, my insurance, uh, maintenance, vacancy rates, um, and mortgage payments. I want to have double that in revenue coming in for my rentals. So I kind of balance that out on, you know, do I do it? What kind of financing? How long of a term do I get? And, and so really it just goes down to, you know, what my goals are and what I'm trying to do. Okay. Good stuff. And what are some of the common mistakes you see that you would want to avoid when making your first real estate investment? Yeah, I, I, I wish I'd have known more about wholesaling when I started. Like that's honestly what I would have done first, right? Because, you know, I, I did uh, buy rentals first and then I tried flipping and then I did wholesaling, right? And I wish I'd have done it the complete opposite. I wish I'd have start with wholesaling, then flipping, then buy and hold investing. Um, you know, obviously not too far apart, but I had gotten mm. that first wholesale deal and knew that I could find discounted opportunities. Because think about it this way. If I find a deeply discounted opportunity and I have a ton of all the really good investors in my local area and I blast the opportunity out to them and nobody's interested in the deal, what, what does that mean? It's not a good deal, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know? And so if you are in the business of sourcing discounted opportunities, you're going to get educated by the best investors in your market because you're mm -hmm. going to put out a deal, even if it's a crappy deal. And they're going to say, you know, Zach, you're dumb. It's a crappy deal. And here's all the reasons why, you know, yeah. and I'm going to feel really silly and I'm going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to know a lot more that if I had to go make all the mistakes of knowing what's a good deal and a bad deal and getting yeah. debt and leveraging debt and taking risk to learn all those hard lessons, right? So like, you know, you get a property under contract that has fire damage, you blast it out and learn from your investors what they know about fire damage, right? You yeah. don't have to have all the answers Absolutely. when you, when you do it this way. Uh, that's why I love it. You earn and learn, right? For sure. And, um, so Investors, to that point, how, how how are you building your network of investors? How do you go about that? Yeah, so uh, you know, building your buyers list or networking. There's there's a few things you can do. You can call uh, your real estate agents that are doing work and say, "Hey, do you want to be added to my buyers list? If you bring me a buyer, I'm happy to pay you a, co a commission on it." So you can work that way. Uh, there's the county courthouse auctions. Uh, you can go to like auction.com and figure out when your county courthouse is doing auction. Show up five ten minutes early ask everyone for their email and phone number and names out of your email list. You can go to Facebook groups for investors for your local areas, the REI association groups. Um, there's lots and lots of places to build them. Uh, what I did on the 40 day challenge is I went to each individual wholesaler in the area and I said, Hey, do you want to build your buyers list? They said, yes, because more buyers equals bigger deals. Um, and I said, fantastic. How many do you have? And they're like, Oh, I got a thousand. I've got 2000, whatever it was. Right. And I say, okay, fantastic. I'm going to try and at least double your email list. I'll count you in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to trade some email lists. I have, I have some 
um, but I'm working to get a few other people on board. If you're interested in trading, I could really grow your email list. Are you interested if I can get you a lot more than you're giving me? Oh yeah, I'd be interested. Okay, I'll be calling you once I have a bunch of, uh, you know, once I confirm that I can at least double your list because I don't want to waste your time. Okay, okay, great. Then I got I got Bob on the you know on board. I got Sam on the board. I, I've got all these people ready to go to give me their buyers list. I say, okay, everyone send me your buyers list. I got rid of duplicates and sent everyone the new robust email list. And I had like 7,000 buyers, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks. So okay. there's lots of creative ways. There's ways to build those buyers list really fast. Okay, good stuff. Yeah, Zach, I think you were very fortunate to have a father that was able to get you motivated and say, hey, you're going to have to figure it out yourself at that at such a young age. I mean, I think such a lot. Of, yeah, so at the time you probably didn't think so, but no, I hindsight, it, it. yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure you. I'm sure you love him for it now, right? Oh, I do, I do, and I, I you know, it's it's really cool because, um, you know, I, I look back at at life and and the opportunities that I've been given, and, and I know not everyone has had such awesome opportunities and yeah i had some obstacles and maybe some people don't have but you know i understand that if we don't have the belief that we can be successful we won't try we won't give it that massive amount of effort just ourselves and we're going to ever achieve the success and freedom that we all desire. And so, you know, I'm just grateful for what I've been given and the confidence that I developed at a young age, you know, 17, becoming an entrepreneur and having some successes and a lot less burdens on me. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a wife when I was trying to become an entrepreneur. And I guess there was a lot less fear of failure at that point. And I, I'm so grateful my dad at an early age gave me incentive and a desire to change. And so you know, this 40 day challenge and, you know, my podcast and my YouTube channel, my TikTok, like the whole reason I do all this is, um, is I want to help people. I want to give them that belief, right? I want to give them that, that courage that I was able to receive at 17 years old that, you know, it was kind of just blind ignorance that I had the confidence, mm -hmm. you know, but I want people to have that confidence in themselves and like see me doing it and be like, no, Zach's a cool guy. I like him and everything, but he's not that great. You know, there's nothing mm. unique about him other than he has a lot of work ethic, but so do I. Like, that's the whole reason that, that I did that 40-day challenge. So, so y'all can, like, watch it, see what it takes, exact action steps, and, like, you know, see for yourselves. Like, is this really something I want to be a part of? Um, and, then, and then go change your life. Yeah, and you said something that was key. I mean, you're never going to achieve – what you want or become the person you want to be unless you truly believe you can do it. So you have to have that yeah. belief that that's key. And the funny thing about opportunities, I mean, yeah, a lot of people like to say they don't have the opportunities this person has, but there's opportunities out there in front of you every day, right? You just have to be able to recognize them when they're there in front of you. So I truly, I truly believe, truly believe that as well. But yeah, good stuff. So, so Zach, let's, um, Let's jump into the lightning round before I let you hop off. I know you're headed out to view some property. So real quick, um, what book or books have greatly influenced your life? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the great thing is you never stop reading because at different points in your life, you'll be ready to receive information that will be relevant to you. Um, but uh, some very impactful books at the times that I read them uh, was – Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was massively impactful. Um, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was massively impactful. And um, an amazing book that really helped me understand my students and even family and people's uh, insecurities and and like limiting mindsets around money that I would highly suggest if you're not having massive amounts of financial success right now is secrets of the millionaire mind. So maybe those three books is what I'd suggest. Okay. Yeah. All very good books. Okay. And Zach, how has a failure or perceived failure actually allowed you a greater success later? 
Um, well, I, I can share one. So uh, I learned something called limiting beliefs from Tony Robbins. And so what limiting beliefs are, you know, stories, things that we tell ourselves about ourselves that might not necessarily be true. So when I was younger, uh, I kind of struggled in traditional education. Uh, I, I, I don't necessarily think I have learning disabilities, but I didn't learn as well as what I perceived my, you know, colleagues in school learning. I uh, didn't uh, go far in college at all. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have gotten good grades if I wasn't so good at convincing the teachers that they, they should give me a good grade. <laughs> but like my test scores were horrible. And so I always told myself that I was dumb. And so since I was dumb, I had to hustle. And for a time that served me because if you hustle, usually you're going to get something in life. Right. And so I worked really hard because I told myself I was dumb. So I had to hustle. But the funny thing with limiting beliefs is they serve us for a time, but they get to the point where they become obstacles to our progress as people. And, um, I, I started to tell myself I was too dumb for certain tasks and certain things that were required for me to excel in my businesses. And uh, so I started making decisions because I was not willing to learn or step out of my comfort zone to learn new things because I was, in my mind, dumb. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, my piece of advice is to, or, or the mistake that I made is, is not realizing that these limiting beliefs were holding back. They weren't serving me. And I made a lot of decisions, especially in my window cleaning business that, that really held me back for years that shouldn't have. So, you know, I think the mistake was having those limiting beliefs and not really, I I had them for so long. Um, and, and maybe perhaps, you know, the listener would benefit because you guys can self-evaluate like what limiting beliefs, like what negative things are you saying to yourselves? And are those really true? Or are those just things that you're saying to, you know, excuse yourself from getting out of your comfort zone? All right, excellent. All right, just a couple of more and I'll let you off. So, Zach, what is your favorite place to think big? The mountains. The mountains, for nice. sure. So, I'm a big time outdoorsman. I do a ton of hiking and uh, uh, archery hunting. And uh, being able to go for a hike and just be all by myself, I did a lot of solo backpacking trips. Um, it's my happy place, for sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely some fresh air in the mountains. I like to actually do a lot of trail running in the mountains. So I would definitely concur with you there. All right. And, and last one, Zach, what, what have you become better at saying no to? You know, um, it's interesting because I've learned that if you don't have, well, let's say this, when you start to get this this belief that there's an abundance of wealth, you see opportunities everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Like you start to see, I can make money do this. I could do that. I could do this. And you have this mind that all of a sudden starts to see opportunity everywhere. And if that's not happening, that's not a good thing. That, like that should happen, right? It, mm -hmm. Usually you have a massive amount of scarcity in your life. You don't feel that it's possible. So if you're not having that happening, that's not a good thing. But what I've learned is you actually have to learn to, to filter that and say no to the majority of those opportunities. Um, why? Uh, the reason being is there is a limited amount of time. And if you dedicate only a, a half, you know, half hearted effort to a particular task, remember when I said you have to have a massive amount of effort to get results. Well, if you do things halfway and you're going to this and to that, you're not going to get those massive results that are really going to move the needle in your life. Um, so what I've done to, to say no is every time I see an opportunity, I got to put it against the filter of the goals that I've set. So if we don't have goals and directions and things that we're trying to achieve, you'll say yes to everything and you won't ever achieve anything, right? So it's very important to have those goals, have those things. And anytime an opportunity and new thing comes across your table, you know, that was unexpected or these new opportunities, is it going to move the needle to accomplish the goal or not? And you say no to the ones that don't. Excellent. I love that. I love that. All right. Very good, Zach. So um, before I let you go, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, collaborate with you, um, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, you guys can shoot me a DM through Instagram. Um, my Instagram is Zach Booth. Uh, you guys should sh shoot me a direct DM there. 
um, probably the best way, but I'm on every single social media platform, pod, you know, podcast, uh, uh, YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, wherever you like to consume content. I have amazing content that can help, help you guys for sure. Okay, great. And I have all your social media, um, handles. So we'll run those across the screen. So everybody will have those as well. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Zach, this has been great. Thanks so much for, um, coming on the show. Um, hope you have a successful um, property visit and um, we'll be talking again very soon. All right. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. All right. Have a good one, my man. There you have it, guys. Another episode of Dealmaker Diaries in the books. If you enjoy and or find value in what we're doing, please do leave us a nice review. It goes a long way in keeping the show moving in the right direction. For you investors, if you're looking for places to put your hard-earned capital to work, head on over to our website, g1cgrp.com, and sign up for our investor list to be informed of the different projects we're raising capital for that will provide you with the cash flow your investments so much deserves. <laughs>